Yeah. You Welcome to Yom Kippur services. <laughs> the big crowd came. We obviously uh, we filled a need. Filled a need. Shelly, thanks for the. You can blame me. I, we can blame. You can blame. Great time. Um, everything I always wanted to learn in Sunday uh, school. It, it, it's not well. Everything I always wanted to learn or understand about Judaism that they didn't teach me in, in Sunday school. And uh, my, my best example is the following. I might as well start on color, right? <laughs> so um, I was teaching a class, a high school class. Well, this is probably about, probably about 15 years ago because because the young lady is now a uh, uh, pediatric neurologist, like I <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it's an experience that I will never forget. Um, and it was uh, right around this time of year, high school class, and and we were we were reading the Megillah, the story of Esther, mm -hmm. but really trying to understand it not the way that we teach it in Sunday school for the second and third graders, right? Okay. So I said, okay, let's really look at the let's really look at the text. And let's ask ourselves some good questions about <coughs> about um uh, you know was was Mordecai really right uh correct in telling Esther that she shouldn't inform the king that she was Jewish. Okay. How do you feel about that? Right. We're talking with the talking with the high school kids. Da, 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 da. And then it kind of evolved into okay, and then after you know Ahasuerus sends Vashti away because she wouldn't dance in the nude. And they said, what? Wait, what? Rabbi, what? <laughs> well, yeah. You know, she was supposed to display all of her beauty in front of his, uh, his, uh, you know, his assistants, his cabinet, his his ministers. Oh, okay. These are you know, 16, 17 year old high school kids. Okay, we're we're starting to see this story a little bit differently now. Okay, um, and. Uh, what do you think? What what uh, qualities do you think and characteristics do you think that Esther had to display to um, uh, to the king's eunuch uh, to become a finalist in uh, you know in the beauty pageant to be selected as the queen? Oh, okay, all right, and you know, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And says, okay, so here's the here's the real one that you need to really think about. And 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 and, and this is where I for, till my dying day, it would be a long time away, that that I I will still see Elizabeth Nagel's face as we talked about this. Now you're old enough to understand when the king said. You can only come close to me when my scepter is extended. <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and, and uh, literally, dear friends, I could still see now Dr. Elizabeth Nagel, but I can still see her face as she imagined <laughs> what was really going on. In that you know, in that story, there in the text, where it where it says, you know, the you know, she may not enter the king's courtroom or was that his you know his, his uh, you know his, his, uh, uh, you know until he lifts up his scepter towards her, you know, and what uh, okay, <laughs> all right. Anyway, so yeah, so there are there are certainly there are. There are things that they didn't teach us, or we didn't teach them uh, in Sunday school, or didn't teach didn't teach you. Um, and there's a big difference in looking at Judaism or any religion as adults, say as senior citizens, 
with life experiences and and looking back at the stories and the values and the lessons and they take on a different a different meaning a, a different meaning um so what i wanted to do and i sent out a little thing that some of you may have some of you may have seen is um we're going to be together for four or five weeks five six weeks whatever it is um i wanted to use today um with some basics and what's more basic than god concepts I'm talking about talking about god from the jewish point of view from an adult jewish point of view um i want to talk about um what we call from womb to tomb right uh some of the things that we do and some of the things that we don't do as jews where they came from whether they're true traditions whether they're mitzvot in the sense of commandments from god whether they're bubble mices whether they're you know superstitions or whether they really have no basis and background in judaism at all um i want to look at some of the stories not necessarily the purim story but look at some of the stories that are familiar to us and I'm going to give you one more example of this too Will, before we actually get started. But just look at some of the stories, the most well-known stories or incidents or characters in the Torah, especially, but also in other parts of the Bible, and even some names that you might have might have heard of from um, other eras in Jewish history. Um, there was one more that I was going to do, and I'm blanking on on what it was at this point. And then what I'm what I would ask you over the next couple of weeks is submit to me whether it's you know give me a piece of paper, send me an email, text, whatever it is. If you have a question about you know I've, I've heard that we do the Jews do this or don't do this or believe this or don't believe this, okay, you know ask me and we'll and we'll make certainly the last the last session. We'll make it specifically on things that you want to know more about. And I jokingly say that's not stump the rabbi. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 ask, it's ask the rabbi. I am the first one to say, believe me, the first one to say that you have three rabbis, you'll have at least five opinions. <laughs> you will be hearing my interpretation or sometimes I really don't know. <laughs> You'll hear my my ignorance, which happens frequently. But um, Judaism, thankfully, is a religion and a, and a set of beliefs and practices that resonate with different people for different ways, in different circumstances, in different periods of history. Um, and when I look around the room, I know most of you and know some of your histories and and whatever. But um, I don't I don't mind saying and some of you will relate. Uh, I mean, most of you know I think that we we lost a teenage son to cancer, um, and you know my belief about God, my belief about the Jewish practices in death and dying were totally different when it was only a you know a hypothetical kind of thing. Uh, or when I buried my parents, as opposed to burying a child. It, it changes. Life causes those kinds of changes. Judaism, I happen to believe, understands that and, and affirms the ability to change. I, I use the word reform, if you will, but I'm using it with, with a small r, not a capital R. I don't mean to reform me, but we we reform our thinking and still stay within the large umbrella group of of the jewish community um so i, I wanted to give you one other example on the way that i want to uh, uh, approach this um and and we'll 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 spend more time on it uh on, on the day that we look at some uh, uh biblical the biblical stories and uh and whatever um but um 
some of you are in a similar situation to Lynn and, and me, where it's a second marriage, and you're step parenting and stepchildren and children that are born into the second marriage, and, and you know all and and all of the different dynamics that 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 come to play in that. So I, I will assume that everybody's familiar with the story. It's Genesis chapter twenty-two of what we call the, the binding of Isaac, or the sacrifice of Isaac, right? God, God says to uh, Abraham in the middle of the night, take your son, your only son, Isaac, because Ishmael and Hagar have been banned, but um, you know, take Isaac, take him up to the top of the mountain and, and offer him as a sacrifice, okay? And, and as as... Abraham is ready to bring the knife down to slaughter his to slaughter his son. An angel of the Lord calls out to him and says, "Abraham, that's a call twice. Abraham, Abraham, don't do that. Right? This is just a test, testing to see, you know, if you are faithful. Whatever, don't do this. Now I know that you're that you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Abraham slaughters a ram instead." Because the ram was caught in the thicket by by its shofar, right? right. By its horn. That's why we sound the shofar. Um, <coughs> yeah. And um, uh, then then it says, and then Abraham and his servants returned home. What happened to Isaac? <laughs> Isaac's not mentioned again. Isaac never speaks to his father again. I think I can I think I can understand that, right? Okay, all right, but what, you know, but what happens? Anyway, there are many, many ways, and if you really want to study, study the, the Torah study class on Saturday morning, you long past that, but if you, if you want to, there's a, there's a book by Sholem Spiegel called The Last Trial, if you want to, if you really want to uh, explore that, and it's, it's a fascinating, fascinating story in, in, in the Torah, but it needs to be understood in context not taken out of context. Taken out of context is as we originally prepare it, and I'm sorry, as we originally present it, is God gives Abraham a test. Okay. Will you do what I tell you to do? No matter as hard as it might be, will you sacrifice your son to demonstrate your loyalty and your faithfulness to me, and Abraham passes the test, and God said, "Okay, now you know we're not going to let you go ahead and kill your son." But uh, you know, so so we understand. That's the way we usually look at that story. And if you looked at hundreds of years of rabbi sermons, for that matter, not just rabbis, ministers, priests, mm -hmm. imams. Okay, that, that it's a test. It's God created this test for Abraham. But I think you need to look at the story speaking as a divorced and then remarried with step stepchildren. And it, I think we need to look at that story for who Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac really were in the terms of their family dynamic. And the family dynamic of the time. And the family dynamic of, of, of the time. Right. Okay. That's what they Sarah said. had forced Hagar and Ishmael, who was <laughs> Abraham's firstborn. Sarah was barren. So she gave Abraham I mean, this in and of itself is a is a is a question or questionable <laughs> practice, but Sarah says to Abraham, take my 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 maidservant, Hagar. Okay. And maybe she'll be able to give you a son, which which she does. Abraham doesn't say, are you sure, Sarah? You really want me to do that, Sarah? You know, sure. okay. No, not, not, not. All right, anyway, uh, that's back to the person with the, with the high school. All right, uh, uh, okay. But uh, so, so Hagar has a son with, 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 with Abraham named Ishmael, right? And everything is honky dory until Sarah does get pregnant. And 
conceives and bears a son whose name becomes Isaac. He's a source of laughter, or if you want to translate it as a source of irony. Yeah. Okay. And now what does Sarah do? Sarah says, well, we no longer need Hagar and Ishmael. Send them away. And Abraham, what do you mean? You know, he, he's, he's like a wife to me. And he's my he's my son. I don't care. Send them away. All right. Now God saves them. They're not. They're, they don't die out in the desert. God saves them. Abraham may not may or may not know that. We're not sure. Um, but Isaac now, so that when the story comes in chapter twenty two, and God's message to Abraham is take your son. He doesn't have to ask which son. There's only one son left. Right? Take your son out in the middle of the night. Okay. And so is Abraham just following God's command? Or is Abraham saying, now Sarah will get to understand a little bit of how I felt? Mm -hmm. right? You know, when, when she wakes up, she wakes up in the morning and I'm not here and Isaac isn't here. Uh oh. Now she's gonna. Now she's gonna understand. Okay, she made me. She made me send away. You know my my firstborn, and now I'm gonna take her firstborn. Okay, it, it, it's an interesting way of looking at it. I don't know what the truth was. I wasn't there. <laughs> but, uh, again, I can say to the high school kids, I'm old, but I'm not that old. But uh, all right. But it it adds a different dimension to looking at the story okay when when you realize and i've certainly spoken to many many parents in a second third marriage situation where there's where there are you know new children or whatever and they they say to me you know i will never forget that my ex you know so we were having a custody battle and my ex said I'm going to make sure that you never see your that kid again. Uh, and what does that what does that do to you? What, what does that mean? So again, I don't have any answers, but I just suggest that one of the beauties of our texts and one of the beauties of our tradition is that we can look at some of these stories and still have them speak to us even in our modern age. If not even in a in a new way, in a in a more um, resonating resonating way, if you will. So we'll we'll do we'll do some of that. We'll do some of that also. Um, that's that's what I want to that's what I want to do. That's overview part part number one. Um, part number two. Is I will always have the iced coffee. You learn that about me too. <laughs> um, part number two is the I, I joked before about you know one the three rabbis five opinions what what whatever. Uh, there's very little right or wrong in trying to understand the the lessons of of Judaism. Yes, there are some things that are absolute no-nos. There are absolute no, that's not part of who we are, what we do, what we believe. Um, we'll come back to this, but can you be a Jew and not believe in God? Yes. The answer is, the answer is yes. There are some people who would say no, but those people who say no probably didn't have the same kind of life experiences that some of us, you know, who might have a different, have a different answer. Others might say, well, maybe you don't believe in God now, but something might happen next month that will change your mind or, or, or whatever. Um, there are, so there are two realities. One is that, and, and here, some of you have heard me say this or explain it before, um, religion, any religion, uh, and, and here I'm basing it on a teaching of uh, my professor of philosophy. Uh, he was my sponsor, even though I really didn't take many classes with him, but he was my, 
he was my sponsor for my doctorate. Um, uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Professor Alvin Reines, uh, who said that um, religions come about to provide responses, not answers, but responses to those questions or realities of life for which science or any of the other disciplines can't provide can't tell us you know, what, what to do or how to respond. So science can tell us, um, you know, right, here's one marker, there's one, two markers. If I put them together, I have how many markers? Three, always, right? Okay, that's mathematics is true in that sense, okay? It's always, you know, one plus two, is always going to equal three. Okay. What's going to happen if I drop the marker? If I let go of the marker? Yeah. Okay. All right. You know, science tells us who was that? Galileo? No. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You know, th 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 there's there's a law of there's a law of gravity that that will that will always work. Okay. So there are certain there's certain things that science or mathematics or whatever can can always prove true. But there are lots of things in life for which we don't have ex explanation. Or maybe the explanation for me is not an explanation for you. And that's where religion comes about. Religion comes about to provide responses. How can we respond when there's something that science or the other disciplines can't give us an answer to? Why did my son Justin die of cancer? Okay. Science can explain the cancer, but it can't explain why Justin, as opposed to one of his brothers or his sister, was the one who contracted it. Okay. So all that religion can do is give us some responses on how we should act, how we should believe when those things happen that we don't have answers for. And they may be things that we say, they may be things that we sing, they may be things that we pray, they may be things that we eat, they may be things that we wear, okay? All different responses that have proven satisfying, I guess that's the best word, that have proved satisfying to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people throughout the generations. They don't answer the questions, but they tell us what we can do to somehow move on and to somehow continue to live more fully, even in the, even in the face of, of that which confronts us that we, that we can't understand. In a Christian world, someone who has found all of those satisfying, and that's Professor Reines' word, someone who has found all those satisfying responses is saved. That's salvation in a, in a Christian, in a Christian term, okay? Uh, we don't really have a similar kind of, kind of phrase in in Judaism, but the but the goal is to find this a set of responses, not a hundred percent, maybe only sixty percent, but a set of responses of things to do, things to say, things to sing, things to wear, things to eat, that allow us to feel that life is still worth living, that we can go on, etc., etc., etc. So, so that's also an, an underlying, underlying statement of at least the way that I approach all of these things that we're going to be talking about. The other disclaimer, um, I, this this should be easy enough to uh, to understand and explain. The the other is that um, I'm not surprising anybody. I hope. 
when I tell you that uh, we're all human. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I, I'm sorry. Sorry. All right. <laughs> well, with the exception of, uh, right, you know, oh. okay, we got, we got some of this. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. No, but we're all human meaning meaning that um by definition we're going to make mistakes by definition um we are um uh well you can give all kinds of all kinds of adjectives i suppose uh, all, all, you know, all, all kinds of things. That, but we will we will make mistakes. Um, we have the we have the ability to improve. We have the uh, ability to repent, if you will, to do teshuva. Um, and um, but similarly, by definition, God. This is my segue into God concept. Then. By definition, God is not human. By definition, okay. And since God is not human, it is almost impossible to describe God in human terms. Okay, right? Uh, because, and and I don't mean like the difference between. Uh, the way somebody from Michigan would use a particular term as opposed to the way somebody from Arizona or California or or Europe or Australia would use this or South America, South Africa, you know, would would use the same the same term and, and it means it may be only a slight nuanced difference or it might be a major difference. Uh, these are, I always remember using Benji, my youngest, uh, he's a musician. And he and he came to me one day. He said, "Dad, I want you to, I, I want you to hear this music." Uh, and I said, oh, "Okay, I'll listen to it." He said, "Yeah, it's really sick." <laughs> he said, "Oh, okay, Benjamin. Before I listen to the music, does that mean that it's good or that it's bad? Because I just don't know." He said, "It's sick, uh, literally." You know um that that people use people generations or geographic locations use the same words but 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 differently right and when it comes to god either by using only human terms at which after all although some of us are more brilliant than others we're all brilliant but some are more brilliant than others and some have a more extensive vocabulary than than others and others some can speak more languages than than others some find Hebrew difficult and others don't. <laughs> all right anyway anyway, anyway. all right anyway. but the, the minute that we start to use a human language to describe that which is not human we're automatically adding a limitation if not uh, a misinterpretation. Example: one contemporary and one very old. Contemporary, personal experience. Long before Michigan, I was a rabbi in Santa Monica, California. Okay, okay. But that's the long way. Okay. That's Santa Monica. Okay. All right. And I was sitting on Wilshire Boulevard at Froman's Deli. Right. Froman's Deli, it's at uh, 19th, Wilshire 19th. Okay. Lo and behold, who's at the next table? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh. Okay. And I'm looking at this guy whose arms are as thick as my body. Right? Okay. Uh, you know, hello, Mr. Schwarzenegger. Uh, hello. Yeah. You know, um, I don't remember. And anyway, and but it gave me for some reason the word maybe it was I was in class or something, but the word strong had run across my mind. And I'm looking at this guy, you know, not only before I was governor, Mr. Universe, you know, whatever it is, you know, da, da, da. now thus is strong, right? This is. This is strong. Just look at the guy, all right? But 
Is that the same strong as the 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 word when we use it referring to God? No. You know how how can it be? But it's the same word. That's the same word only because we don't have a different word that relates to God's strength. All right, compassion, mercy. All right. Is it, is it, is it, is it, how do I how do I describe God as a compassionate God who took my 18 year old son, you know, and made him suffer with cancer? Where's the compassion there? All right. Is it that God is not compassionate, or is that compassion is the wrong word to to apply to God? That and that's an open ended question. That's not you know. Um, so, the, so those are those are the contemporary applications. But here's a traditional application, and I, I don't take credit for this. This is in it's not it's not in the Talmud, but it's but it actually goes back to about the sixth century. God is all knowing. God is all powerful. Right? If God is all powerful. Can God build a wall so strong that it can't be knocked down? Okay. If God can do anything, God can build a wall. But if God can't knock that wall down, then God is not all powerful. Okay. Now, is the issue a limitation of God's power? Or is the issue that we're hung up on using language, you know, in a in a human contradictory way that just doesn't make sense? And I'm sure that there are other, call it a riddle, or I don't you know, I'm sure that there are others that you've heard of or can or even can can think of. So we need to remember that in any of the terminology that we're using, especially today when we're talking about God, any of the terminology is human terminology. And by definition, it's gonna, it's gonna be limiting. Or as my, my rabbi Horowitz, who we were talking about earlier, Philip, not Philip, uh, Horowitz, as, as he said, he says, we're, we're using the wrong measuring stick. To, de to describe God if we're using human language, whether it's English, whether it's Hebrew, whether it's Yiddish, you know, what whatever. We can we can try, but it by definition, it can't be it can't be exact. Okay. All right. And any questions so far? So calling the Who's calling with a uh, somebody all powerful? Uh, somebody all powerful, <laughs> or someone, or someone didn't like the uh, Okay, so um, Jewish tradition, um, when when we talk about trying to understand God or define God. Jewish tradition, the traditional literature, basically falls on a number of medieval commentators, the most uh, commentators, philosophers, theologians, the most famous of which is a name that you've probably heard my mom use. But there's Ibn Ezra and there's Crestai and there's, and, there's, and, and there, there are a number, number of others all, all from this, all from the same uh, uh, either background, somewhat the same time period. But Maimonides, um, and and uh, amongst uh, amongst many of his writings, but one one the, the one book that a lot of people quote uh, in, in Hebrew is called the Mora uh is the, the guide of the perplexed and. Uh, you know, the, the joke in rabbinic school in the in the uh, seminary was, well, who's the who's the one who's perplexed? The students or the or Maimonides my my himself? Uh, you know, guide of the perplexed or guide for the perplexed. We're not really sure which which it is. 
Um, but, it, but Maimonides tries to, you're, you're, we're perplexed because we're trying to understand, and this is not a 21st century question, it's a thousand year old, 1100 year old question. The relationship between science, you know, between science or knowledge, if you will, and and religion or faith, uh, you know, it, it, so that's that's we're we're all perplexed by that, um, and so Maimonides comes along, writes a whole book about it, which I you know I try to try to you know synthesize into uh, three sentences, uh, but but um, what Maimonides does is says the best that we can do is talk about what God is not. Ultimately, that's the best of what we what we can do. And, and the knots, yes, many of them come from other religions and other cultures, but the knots also come from, that's N-O-T-S, not K-N-O-T-S, right? They, the, the, the knots also come from, as Rhinus was saying before, that people who have tried to provide responses or ways of understanding certain things that happen and have determined that those just are not satisfying responses. Okay. Um, there's a lot of talk about that with after the, after the Holocaust. But, um, <coughs> so Maimonides, <coughs> Maimonides does this. It, it, we, we have to start actually with describing what God is not for for us. Right. Um, so here's the here's a little experiment. Um, and, and we we titled this of you know they didn't teach me this in Sunday school or or whatever it was. So so go back in your mind to the earliest Jewish experiences that you might have. Now, now for some of that may be only within the last few years. Uh, you may be new to the Jewish community. That's that's fine. For others, it might be 50, 60, 70 years, years ago, you know, at the grandma and grandpa's house or, or whatever it is. But what are some of the first specifically Jewish memories that, that, that you have? What's a, a memory that specifically has a Jewish component to it? Is any of that your Jill? My grandfather touching the... Uh, what's the thing that you put on the outside? Mezuzah. The mezuzah? Yeah. Uh -huh. Touching the mezuzah before going into the apartment. Why do you think he did that? What did it mean to him? What was that? What did it mean? Did you ever ask him? Or did he want you to model it when you got tall enough to do it? You know? Why do you think he did that? It's a Jewish tradition and, it, and it's. Uh, Church respect of blessing the home. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, okay, great. Right. All right. So, it's blessing, asking God every time you make this acknowledgement, excuse me, every time you make the acknowledgement, you're asking God to bless the home and the family within yeah. and whatever. Okay. All right. Who else has, what's an, what's an earlier? So, and the horses. <laughs> and the horses. <laughs> They're in the stable now. Not in the apartment complex on the sixth floor. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, right. Anyone else have a have an early memory that you can that you can identify specifically? Jeanette, what? Uh, it involved uh, -huh. or inviting people for because you brought your or something. Okay. Jewish memory. With the um, lighting candles. Lighting the candles, okay. Um, my parents were fed by a very really well set table with the whole family. So, so which is the stronger melody, uh, uh, memory? The candles or the or the food? Um, I think it's probably the candles. The dining room full of food and family. The, okay, so the experience, <laughs> everything together. <laughs> Okay, all right. Rabbi, uh, Con Connie has something. Connie, Connie something. okay, one, one second, you'll, you'll be next, Connie. Okay. I remember as a 
Yeah, we are working with my grandfather, my temple, working now for flags. Must have been a good simple story. Simple Torah, right. Simple Okay, I have a similar one. That that okay. So, but what? So, what is the, what is it about that memory that you think that sticks with you? I don't have too many memories of my grandfather um, as a soft person, and somehow this reminds me of that more more of him rather than Jewish um, okay. identification. Like that. Okay, got it. Okay, all right, Connie. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my older brother's bar mitzvah. I was 10, he was 13. So just the family, mostly the family, getting dressed up, getting new clothes. I remember nothing about the service. I just rem I remember the pictures. I have pictures. I don't remember the service, but a lot of um, getting dressed up and going to temple. And although I went to Sunday school, and Hebrew school, um, that memory stands out a little more. I, I'm not sure why, except it was a bigger deal, maybe. Okay. Okay. I think my most precious memory was a fairly recent one. Um, it was the first time I saw the Torah being carried through the congregation and people reaching out to kiss it. And that really touched me deeply. Uh, okay. Who, who's in the red corner? I can't see. That's it. Gloria. That's, it's Gloria. Gloria. Um, my, mem my memory is uh, going to driving for, I don't know how long, forever to, to New York City to my grandparents, I must have been about three years old or four years old, and um, to a Seder. And uh, I knew it was a Seder, I didn't know anything about it. Um, and uh, I, I said something uh, that I don't remember now in Yiddish, um, which was uh, uh, something I knew at an early age. Um, to, uh, to my grandmother and everybody in the room laughed. Um, I guess uh, uh, several years later, my mother told me they weren't laughing at me, but they were laughing because I was speaking Yiddish um, and I was so little. And um, I did not, I guess I didn't know that people, everybody didn't speak Yiddish. Um, it, it, because it, um, although my sister and brother didn't, my parents did at home. The it. other thing I, I just want to mention is that I can't hear anything from the people at the table when they speak. Thank you very much. Can, can you, Connie? Yes, I can. You can. No, must be me. Okay. We'll, we'll try to speak a little louder. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The, the thing I remember as loud as possible. Okay. <laughs> I I remember um, many things, but something that stands out always is the first time I, I heard a shofar inside the temple and I started to cry and my whole body reacted, but it wasn't unhappy. I just couldn't explain why this thing reverberated inside me and I reacted so strongly to it. Um, it was a very powerful reaction, and to this day, I still react the same way. When I hear the shofar blown, like my Finkelstein blows it, you know, because it's full force. But something goes through me, and I, I, now, in my old age, I think of it as a connection to the past, uh, a tie to a country I, I would love to visit, but have never gotten to. Um, how, how many millions of people through the generations have heard that same sound and responded with trembling, awe, fear, joy, whatever it might be. Yeah, okay. All right. My first thing was, I, I love my father more than anybody, okay? And uh, he used to go to the temple and that was a big no-no. 
in the communist country, but he did. And he went to an orthodox temple that the guy knew down downstairs and women upstairs. And one guy was a little kid, like five, six years old. They allowed me to stay with my dad. And as long as they allowed me to stay with him, I went to temple after the guy. <laughs> because to me, as a five, six years old, temple means being with dad. Okay. Richard. Yeah. Um, my father, who is a Jew of my parentage, um, didn't practice, didn't acknowledge in any way, shape, or form being Jewish. But he ate Jewish. Huh. He ate. He ate. 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 Uh -huh. He ate kasha and bush. And, and, and I always identify, and I still have a jar of the kasha that I've never cooked because I don't know what to do with it, but I always want to have that jar as a reminder that there was some Jewishness in my father long before. I gave him a high when I was in high school and I could afford a gold high. You know, uh, that was when he first said he was Jewish. I mean, acknowledged it openly, he wore it proudly. But I associate those foods with, you know, I know they're probably just Russian, you know, Eastern European. Yeah, food, definitely, but, definitely. <laughs> but I still, you know, every time I see borscht or kasha, you know, it brings me back to me as a kid with my mm -hmm. father eating these things. Gotcha. Gotcha. I have one little one that relates to that. My grandmother was an amazing Jewish cook and she could fit, she had a, a her kitchen was about half the size of this table and right. this little galley. And she would spend days because she had to stack things up all the time. It, it was really cool. Pass on it. I always miss her the most. But anyway, um, my first memory is what she asked. And it wasn't so much of, it was, my dad was an agnostic and, a, and a, usually an a, a, what's, atheist. And um, I was never. And he, I used to drag him outside at two or three, you know, and, and say, well, how can you say that when the stars are in the sky and everything, you know, it's so good. How can you say there's no God? You know, there's no good, there's no God. It's so I was a little, little person that made a difference in his life. And um, it's my question. Hmm. All right, I'll do mine, then I want to move on. Mine, my first specifically Jewish memory, I was probably four, four and a half. Uh, my mother's father was one of the lay leaders of a very small Orthodox synagogue in, in Cleveland. Uh, basically, it was a house, you know, whatever. And there were a number of, you know, people who would daven at the house and, and, and there was a, um, and, uh, but I just, like, remember of, with, with the marching around, right, okay, and um, till the day he died, my that grandfather had a flaming red beard down, <laughs> down to here. And I remember I was he was holding me, I was on one side, holding, he was holding me, and the Torah scroll was on the other side. And we're you know marching around. I didn't understand what what was going on or whatever, but I instinctively knew that if 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 he was going to drop one of us, <laughs> it was, he was going to drop me. Not the, not the and so, so I was holding on to his beard. <laughs> but that's that's what I remember. Okay, all right. So good, you know, memories. Yes, that that have to do with holiday celebration with individuals, with people who represented the the traditions for us. Uh, things like that. Now, go back to what are some of the earliest phrases, names, words, terms that you remember hearing or or seeing in a book or something like that, or that you imagine a, a name or a, a description of God. What and you know whether it's English or Hebrew or Yiddish or any other any other language, you know. God is the. Think of think, think of translations of some of the prayers from the from the book, if you will. All knowing. Just throw them all out. Okay, God, all all knowing. We talked. Yeah. Okay. Father. Father. 
okay, father, or king. today we would say parent, king, or king. sovereign, okay, monarch, whatever, yeah. Adonai. Healer. Adonai is, uh, is Lord. Healer, okay, more? There's, traditionally, there are at least 70, so we got a lot of Pardon me? 72. I said there's at least 70. King of the universe is what King, King, King of the, of the universe. universe. Yeah, Melech Olam, right? That's okay. his king. The King of Kings. King, king of the Melech Malchai Hamlaki, the King of Kings. Or in the in the rabbinic literature, it's Melech Basar, Melech Basar, the, the the you know the the King of all the the, the King of Kings. As opposed to or the king on high, as opposed to um, the um, uh, 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 flesh and blood king, you know, a human being who's the who's the king of the royal. Did we say creator? Okay, author. You said healer, redeemer is everywhere. Okay. Okay. All all present. Ever ever present. No, my my mother just told me, told us he was everywhere. She said it all the time, and right. that's the way yes, she said God it. Everywhere. Okay. Still, still, still the still small no, voice within. Okay. Otherwise known as in in your tradition, Jimmy Cricket. <laughs> I don't think they understand why. <laughs> right? Okay. Because he wasn't he was very what we did. He's not told her. Everlasting. 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 Yeah. Or eternal. eternal. Okay. All right. Almighty. Almighty. All knowing, okay, almighty, all knowing. Justice. justice. So, something with justice, sorts of justice or? No, sorts of justice. A judge, judge, probably, judge. just the ultimate, the ultimate judge. Okay. Um, okay. All right, fine. You know, so they're, they're all those, sorry. Well, I'm coming. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Sorts of love. Okay. All right. Okay. So all all those all those different different terms. And if again, if we went around the room and if we picked three or four of them, and I said, okay, what are the, define those terms? You know, each of us would have a little bit of a different. We know what we mean, right? But each of us would define it a little bit differently based on who we are. What what our pre what our experiences what our what our own vocabulary what, you know what we're comfortable with things like that okay all right so this is in no particular order but I want to give at least one um, two three four five at least five or six of the the traditional God concept or descriptions, if you will. And again, Maimonides would jump in and say, don't, you know, don't forget, we have to talk about what God is not or what God doesn't do, you know, things, things like that. Okay. So uh, the beauty of Judaism, oh, there's one other background thing that I have to do, but the beauty of Judaism is, is that um, there's no one, there's no one answer. Like there's no one chief rabbi. There's no, there's no Pope. There's no one who says, yeah, you're you're yeah. And despite what they're trying to do in Israel right now. But there's you know, there's there's no one who says, I'm right, I'm right, and you're wrong. Okay. Uh, there are people who try to say that and try to deny that what what we are experiencing here, that's the long temple center in Green Valley. Arizona and, and, and the people would try to say that what we do is inauthentic and that's incorrect. <laughs> to use a polite, to use a polite term. Okay. All right. Um, from Maimonides on down, okay? um, a community 
where individuals gather together in respect to, to study, to pray, to support each other, God's presence dwells among them. <clears throat> Doesn't, the, we don't have to define what God's presence, you know, it, is, I shouldn't say you know, God, the God, what God's presence is, but there's, there's a recognition from Jewish tradition that those people, whenever there are people together who are seeking a better world, who are studying and who respect each other and support each other, God's presence is there. Now, along comes a couple, along comes, Losing my English. <laughs> Along come several rabbis, including uh, a, a contemporary 20th century young fellow by the name of Danny Siegel. You may have seen some of his writing. He's a poet. He's a poet. He's a student of Midrash and, and whatever. He, he says who says the following that um, he interprets he interprets it this way that if you're sitting in if you're sitting with your neighbor and you're waiting for the Messiah to come and, and the Messiah hasn't shown up yet, you know, look at your watch, you know, you know, the Messiah hasn't come yet, you're waiting, it's a holiday, whatever it is, it's Shabbos. And if you turn to your neighbor and you say, you're my friend, you're my neighbor, you know, we're, we, 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 are, are, we live together, we support each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you show each other a little bit of human kindness. Danny does this more in, in a poem rather than what I'm struggling about with right now. That, that if the Messiah continues to carry, it doesn't even matter. Okay? Because the way that we interact with each other is even more important than waiting, waiting for the Messiah, right? which is a twist on an older rabbinic uh, story that does come from the Torah, uh, from, from the Talmud, that um, Um, there's a rabbi who, let's call him Rabbi Judah, okay, who has a vision, not a nightmare, but a vision. And a vision, his vision is that the Messiah is sitting at the gates of Rome. Uh, and he's dressed as a beggar. You know, alms for the poor, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. And he's sitting at the gates, gates of Rome, and all that that means, but again, we won't go into the Talmudic and historical setting. And this Rabbi Judah says, I must go find the Messiah. I must go find the Messiah. And so he gets on a, on a boat. It's not an ocean liner. Or it's not a cruise ship. He gets on a little boat like Jonah did, right? And he sails to uh, cross the Mediterranean Sea and goes to Rome. And sure enough, there's the Messiah sitting at the gates of at the gates of Rome, dressed as a beggar, and whatever. And Rabbi Judah looks down at the Messiah and says, Messiah, what, what are you doing? And the Messiah says, Well, I'm waiting. And Rabbi Judah says, You're waiting. I mean, there are people all over the world, but he necessarily all over the world, but I mean, there are people back in the Holy Land who are who are dying, they're ill, and the, and the Romans are are persecuting us, and this, and this, and there's famine, and there's pain, and there's this, and this, you know, why are you waiting? I'm waiting. Well, what in the world are you waiting for? I mean, you can do so much, you can save us. I'm waiting for you to ask you, what are you waiting for? All right, that's that's the Talmudic story on which Dan Siegel bases bases his kind of teaching. That what Judaism basically says, 
no matter what you believe about God, no matter what you want to believe about the Messiah, and we'll, if we have time, we'll talk about the Messiah today, otherwise in, in, in a couple of weeks. But, uh, but it, it's not even, as much as I would said, I'm going to start here with talking about God concepts. God concepts aren't even the most important thing in Judaism. Okay? It's what we do with and for each other. God, could, God can, that's what God wants us to do. God, God can wait, you know, before sending the Messiah and whatever. That's what historically, that if you want to spend your time thinking, you know, and, and, and practicing, and I don't mean practicing, thinking and studying and, you know, and whatever, and trying to figure everything out, just realize that while you're doing that, there are people who need you. And I would much rather, God says, I would much rather that you focus on their needs than worrying about understanding me. Right? So that's the, that's the, 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 what should I call it? The foundational, the under, underpinning of everything that we talk about with, with, with God. And, 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 and I mentioned earlier about uh, hangups with language and, you know, and not having the right, the right vocabulary and the right measuring stick and, and all, you know, that, that's fine. That's intellectual discourse. And we can, and, and Jews have always studied and argued and debated and, you know, well, what about this? And what about this? It's a horse, it's a mule, you know, what, what, whatever, whatever it might be. But ultimately, Jewish tradition comes clearly, explicitly, and says, that's all fine and good. But meanwhile, what are you doing to make it a better world? What are you doing to make your community better, stronger, even if you want to say more godlike? Okay, so all that having been said, so here are five or six different ways that Jewish tradition through the through the centuries have proposed that these might answer. Hi, John. Come on in. That, that these might you know, provide, again, not so much answers, but responses. Okay, again, we're not, we can't, we can't give provable answers. We can only give responses to see if this makes, to, if this makes sense for you. And if it does, if it's a satisfying, if it's a rewarding kind of interpretation or, or belief, then Fine, accept it, and then and just remember it every time that you say, "What the Hebrew students amongst us?" And every time that we say "Baruch Ata Adonai" or "Shema Yisrael" or 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 whatever. Okay, all right. So, um, speaking of Maimonides, who was a student of the Greek philosophers. Um, God is the first cause or the prime mover. God starts everything. There is nothing before God and everything is in God and with God and because of God. Don't worry about what God is, just that there, there is a God because that's the starting point. Oh, call it. If you want to call that the Big Bang, then call it the Big Bang. All right, but there there has to be a what do we what what do they call it with with the COVID you know point no, uh, patient zero or patient X or something like this. See, there has to be a starting point somewhere. No matter what you believe, Einstein or whatever, no matter what you believe, but somewhere, sometime, somehow, there's a starting point. And that starting point is God. Okay. Uh, now, the, does that fit into some of the terms that we were talking about before? God as king, God as author, may, maybe not as judge, maybe not, but God as creator. Yeah. You know, so one of the stories or some of the stories is that God said, boom, I'm going to create creatio ad ex nihilo, creation from nothing, nothing, nothing 
before, but everything is in God. Everything is in there. I'm going to create, you know, I'm, going to, I'm the scientist. You're going to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and we're going to pour it together. And, and here's, here's what comes out. And what comes out, according to our literature, is not the beautiful heavens and earth, you know, and sun and, and sun and moon and all this. What comes out first is chaos, right? Is darkness and void. And God says, Oy vey, what have I done? <laughs> right? Okay. God said, This is this isn't this isn't right. I, you know, my my chemical experience experiment here is not really working. So I have to make some changes along the way. Right? Uh, uh, and God said, okay, let's make light, let's make darkness, let's make heaven and earth, and then, you know, da, 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 and on and on through. And whether whether it's a 24-hour period, whether it's a two million year period, what, what we just don't, we just don't know. It um, again, it's not necessarily written as a scientific um uh abstract that's the word i'm looking for you know there's a, here's a here's a proposal for my phd right you know of, of how how we're going to do it uh we don't know exactly what and uh, by again by definition a day well first of all how could you have a day before the before the sun yeah whatever but, you know, so it was a it's a measure of time in for in god's experience that we don't know exactly how long how long that is. It doesn't even matter how long how long it is. But for those who want to see God as the Creator, capital capital C, or as the Prime Mover, capital P, capital M, or the First Cause, capital F, capital C, there's nothing have nothing before. And whatever you want to call that starting point, however you want to understand it. Whether it's in a scientific way, whether it's just in your imagination, but the starting point is God. The question is, what happens after that period of creation? Now, creation is a word that, again, by definition, means coming out of nothing, right? A scientist. We're talking about a little chemical experience, a little bit of experiment, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. That's not creating. That's taking you know, one thing and you're putting it together with something else. By definition, <laughs> by definition, God is the only one who can create. And, and it's interesting for the Hebrew students here among us, it's interesting that anybody remember what the first word or words of the Torah are in Hebrew, Hebrew it's Bereshi. In, in the English, we say beginning. In the in the beginning. In the beginning. Okay. All right. Um, but Bereshi can be understood in a number of different ways. This is the beauty of working with 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 text. Okay, because remember, for those who were here the first the first class. Talk, I talk about it, the three-letter root in the Hebrew. Okay, so what we don't we don't know. It's only guessing. Is the three is the three-letter root of Bereshi? Is it Rosh? Okay, what's, what's your Rosh? Head or beginning, like Rosh Hashanah, yeah. beginning of the year. Okay, or is it the first three letters, which mean which is the verb to create or creation? Okay. What is that? Bara. Okay. 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 So is so the usual translation is in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, right? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Or or is it in in creating the beginning mm -hmm. there was God, comma, heaven, comma. Earth, comma. I mean, you can you can twist it and play with it however you, however you want. Um, that's that's either the beauty or that's the confusion, or as my mom would say, that's the perplexity, right? Of what of what we're faced uh, faced with. But if you want to accept that 
The term God only refers to not something that needs to be worshipped, not something that needs to be prayed to, but God, the word God only means that first whatever, first event, the first, you know, here's where you run out of words, right? The, you know, the, 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 the prime mover, the first cause, the first, the first something or other. And we're going to call that, we're going to call that God. The issue then becomes what happens afterwards? What does God do afterwards? Okay, there's this process of creation, but then when the experiment stops, okay, does God just sit back and watch? Does God, and here's the, the Schwarzenegger kind of thing, you know, <laughs> does God twiddle, twiddle his big bumps? You know, uh, the, the, you know, does God smile? Does God cry? Uh, if you follow some of the Torah, not all of it, but if you follow some of the Torah, God definitely continues to interact and provides or presents experiences, opportunities, tests, whatever. God also has emotions. God re reacts. Okay? God gets angry. God feels pity and compassion, you know, on and on and on. Changes but not, and changes his mind, sure, <laughs> sure, okay, all right. Um, but, so, so you start with that statement of God is the, God is the beginning, right? And then the questions become, what happens, what happens afterwards? So that's that that's one God concept, um, but it comes out of the notion that, like the Greek philosophers, that things like love, truth, kindness, they call them those are the ideals, but they're but they're real, they have lives of their own, right? So if there, if there there is such a thing, and some of the you know the Greeks would say, okay, well there's the God of truth, and there you know and there, or there's this mythical character that represents kindness or something like that. And then similarly, there's like there's a God that represents creation and everything that goes along with it. So that that's that's one kind of thing. It is obviously not the the belief. Or God concept, if I talk about that, on which our prayer book or most of the Torah, not the beginning, not the beginning of Genesis, right? But on most of the Torah. This is that's not the God concept that most of Jewish literature refers to. Right? But it's but it but it is there. It is there. All right. Uh, another one, and you could you can kind of I'm putting like two or three, at least three, together in, into one, um, and 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 not because my uh, my show business person is sitting over here to, 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 to my right, but um, think of God or portray God as the either the the script writer. Director. Okay. Or the director, you know, the stage director, the stage manager, okay, or the producer, okay, the one, the one, either the one who, okay, here's the, here's the script, okay, and all, we're all the actors, okay, the, 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 the writer gives you the script, okay, do with this as you will. And I'm I'm gonna sit sit up in the balcony and and watch. And if I have if I think that you're going the wrong direction, I might send a message. Might, you know, pull off my pull the microphone over and say, change that scene. <laughs> you know, I might, I might do that. Or I might be closer to the stage. I might be sitting in the front row. And I might say, oh no. Rabbi Roman, don't you know? Don't lift your left hand over there. You know, point over this way instead. 
or you know don't tell them to in, in, interpret it this way tell them to interpret it that way or exit stage right or exit stage left or 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 whatever whatever it is okay but you know i hear i told you what's the what's what's your phrase i've told you what is good old 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 man uh, you have been told the old what is what is good and what the Lord require of the be right? Only, only, only to walk from stage right to stage. No, it's only to do justice, love, mercy, and to walk up and walk up with that God. Right. Oh, oh, okay. So here's the here's the manager who says, okay, here's here's the play. Here's your script. Here's here's life. Okay. If you have some questions you want to ask me on how to do it, I'll be glad to give you my advice. Okay, I, and I I have certain things that I suggest in the way that you do it, but you're but you're free to act, you're free to behave and do the play, your life however however you want. I may not like it. I may close the show. <laughs> you know, continue that. You can do that how, however however you want. Okay, but that certainly is also another God concept throughout Jewish history that that different than the first one this one has communication okay it has communication back and forth between the quote unquote the actors all right you and me the people who are living out the script that God has written for us we can ask questions we can ask for advice or we can act it, behave however, however we want, recognizing that there's still the producer or the director or the stage manager who's going to say, no, you're doing it all wrong. You're doing it all wrong. Okay. All right. So that's that's a, that's number two, if you will. You can, again, you however you want to producer, director, stage manager, the script writer. You know, whatever, or all of all of the above. That's a, that's that's another historical God concept. Um, one that probably is the most the most prevalent, and I'm I I I should have said this earlier. I'm I'm oversimplifying, obviously. All right. Uh, I mean, if there's anybody here who has an advanced degree in, you know, theology or philosophy or whatever, you, I, I apologize, but this is, so it's a lot of oversimplification, but um, the, the, the God concept, for lack of a better term, that is probably the most, um, uh, the most prevalent in traditional Jewish literature, let's call it the um, um, uh, the puppeteer. Okay. okay. That the puppeteer that um, literally that God is God has a plan. God is the one who's actually actually in some way or another making me move both of my hands the way that I'm doing it now. Okay. It's not my free choice. It's not my free will. I'm doing it because God is pulling the strings and, and telling me to do it. Right. Uh, and I don't understand why. And I might try to break the string. I might try to you know do it my way. Says Pinocchio. I was going to say, right. come down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, but traditional Judaism would, and, and the traditional text would say that we are living out God's plan. We don't understand what it is. And it's not up, it's not ours to question. We just must accept it. Okay. For one reason or another, not to be understood. That could be argued, 
can be cried, it can be wailed. God determined that my 18 year old son, Justin, was going to die of cancer. Who am I to question that? Okay. It's part of God's plan. Right? Part, you know, and again, just as, as much as moving, moving this arm or any other or any other action, there is no such thing as an accident. Right? There's a there's a there's a reason behind everything, and it's part of God's plan. And yes, we can. We can complain about it, but we can't hope to understand it. We can come to grips with it. We can somehow learn to cope, move on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't try to understand it. Forget that. I'm not proposing that God concept. I'm just suggesting that that's the one that is the most prevalent in Jewish literature okay go ahead and traditional judaism struggled with that with the coming of the holocaust of course yeah 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 of course and how is that answered after the holocaust well it's answered in the same in the same way traditionally traditional using using some of the same spaces <laughs> that we used before the holocaust um, yes, because the traditional literature, whether we agree with it or not, and I, I would presume that most of us don't agree with it, but, but whether we agree with it or not, the traditional literature would say there have been other times when we have been singled out. Okay. The Holocaust is just one of the series. Right, right. And... Uh, you know, sometimes we can identify uh, uh, after the fact, we can identify what we were being punished for. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, we, we part of God's plan is that we are a light to the nations. And, uh, and, and so what we do, how we suffer, and how we respond to that suffering can be a teaching experience for others in the world. Okay, so the, tradi the traditional, uh, and that does not, it probably does not mean in any way a, a majority of the, of the Jewish community. But the traditional literature would 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 kind of see it see it that way. Okay. Um, We'll, we'll come back. I'll come back to that. Okay. Yeah, right. Can we not say that you know the intentional will of God versus the consequence, the consequential will? So, like, it wasn't intended, but the consequence was the world felt guilt for it all, and, and therefore the state of Israel was for So maybe, maybe it wasn't a punishment, but maybe it was a forward-looking thing. I mean, not that I agree. You know, I mean, there, you know, there are like, yes, yeah. there are those in the in in the Jewish community, a very small, a small percent. But there are those who would say, just as the Jewish community in the times of the first and second temple, you know, was not loyal, was not faithful. Uh, there was, uh, you know. Uh, uh, fighting between between groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and so there's, uh, you know, just like after the the flood, and you know, yeah. uh, so that that's all part of God's recurring, right. recurring, you know, recurring plan. Every several thousand years, we need to have that kind of a of a cleansing thing, and let let the world uh, learn learn a lesson. Is that is that there's a small it's a small percentage, yeah. but but you can find some uh, some references to that kind of thought. Yeah. But that's taking the Holocaust as a punishment, right? For, right. Whereas I can also see the Holocaust as a forward-looking, you know, what a means to an end. 
Oh, a means to an end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, necessary to create the social forces to allow yeah, to, to create the world on the of a homeland. Right. So oh, the Jews right. Have I mean, there are right there are some there are some plain, there are some who would say that, and there are some in Christian community. Some of the Christian community there are that are joyful for that. Yes. They're they're exhilarated wow. at the notion that now there's the opportunity for all the Jews to come back to their home. No, no matter no matter what was the reasoning behind it, and since we're all going to be resurrected anyway, you know it's okay. So, uh, all right. Um, so there's the puppeteer. There's the puppeteer concept. I just want to go another couple minutes. Um, there's also, um, and this is close to close to others. That, you know, again, call it and the the architect or the in, or the engineer. Well, there's, the the, yeah, the, there's there's the watch. You want you want to explain um, what you mean by it? Go ahead. Oh, the watchmaker and the deist, um God created. You know, he made this beautiful watch that works and it tells time and does all this wonderful things. But there's the laws that that are built into the watch. You know, the laws of the motion, the cycles, and blah blah blah. And God created that watch, and then stepped back and like was watching. I hate to use that word, but that um, we are then to follow the, those rules. No, God set up all these rules, and we have to follow them because God set them up. Right. So the watchmaker keeps the watch keeps ticking. You know, then that's right. nature. Or or, or or it or stops. It stops. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So the or the architect or the engineer that here are the plans. Here's here's the world. Here's here's my building. Here's 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 the world. Here's how it should look. Here's how it should work. I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna yeah. sit back now, okay? And I've given you all the plans. I've given you all the blueprints. You've got everything that you need, as opposed to first pause where I did everything, okay? And blah, blah, blah. this is you know we work together. Adam we're you know I'm making humanity in my image according to my likeness. This is a project that we're working on together. Okay, we've got it, we've got our world, we've got you know, da, 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 da. it's yours. Okay, I'm gonna sit back and as Ellie Wiesel says, along come the Holocaust, and what's God doing? God's crying. Mm -hmm. This is what this is what you've done with my beautiful building. This is what you've done with my, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, of necessity, and we referred to the Holocaust, but it's not the first time in Jewish literature that we have strains of the 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 20th century phrase was God is dead. Okay. God is so disappointed in what human beings have done, not necessarily the Jews, but what human beings have done that, okay, God, in, in the, the Kabbalistic word of the Tzimtzum, God contracts within, within himself and, uh, and almost disappears or is waiting for some kind of enlightenment that will make it worthwhile to, to reappear and become more involved. Um, okay, I studied the Arab religion. In the Bhagavad Gita, um, what's his name? Krishna says at, at the very end, okay, I told you what to do. You know, I'm getting the, the architect or whatever, and I'll let you do it. But if you mess up, you can use some words, but I use something stronger. Mm -hmm. If you mess up, I'll send somebody else down to remind you. So that's why there are. You know Moses and and Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and blah 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 are all people that God keeps sending down to help us get straight to get follow the blueprint again. Right. Is that a Jew? Huh? I mean, is that tradition? Oh, oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But we got but the Saints. We got but, the Saints. Yeah, but the what well, the you know the the the, the, the tzaddiks, you got the you got the angels, you got oh. the Elijahs, you have got you know all of those all of those all of those characters, uh, you know, who come along. Uh, listen to my teenage sermons on young people. Yes. You know, <laughs> you know, these are, these are the people that answer that question. You know, 
Okay. Um, but in the God is dead, the God is dead theory or our concept is God had the ability to create us. God has the ability to say, you know, just, you know, I, I'm no longer involved. And we and God had the God created us with the ability to leave God or even treat God as if God was dead. Right? That you know, that either we don't believe or either we don't need God. What? Well, isn't it that man created God? Not God created man. Yeah. So yeah. we created them, we can race them too. Sure, sure. Except that that doesn't come out of the literature. No, I'm kidding. Right. That, you're not going to find that. That's how they match. Right. Okay. All right. So uh, to conclude my <laughs> presentation, but take a couple of minutes for questions or debate or whatever, or clarification. Um, so what do you believe, Rabbi? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Um, if you know me, you know that I am I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a tinkerer. I'm not a handyman. Anything like that. So there are lots of things in the way. There are lots of uh, uh, parts, I guess, of the way things work that I don't understand. <laughs> and I and I admit that. So, for example, I do not understand, with apologies to any of the electricians who might be sitting in the room, I do not understand how yeah, I know. Lights. Okay, yeah. you know, you switch it. You switch a light. Uh, you know, and and the light switch a switch. No, and the and the lights come back. Or or uh, or um, and, you know, you have to plug something in, which means that it's there even when I'm not plugging in. Okay, and it and it's and it's a power. It's responsible for the ability for lights to be there. But if I'm not using it and I'm not plugging into it, it's still there. I'm just not taking advantage of it because I don't need it at that minute or whatever. Um, same thing with, I, I look over towards Vlad towards yes. who's smiling at me. <laughs> same, same thing like with, uh, with, a, with a radio. Or in today's world, in cell phones, I can't conceive that you know, all these voices are out. There. No, they're out there. They're out there. They're the in, they're in the air, whatever. But if I have the right kind of receptor, yes. I can I can hear it, and I can speak into it, and somebody else can. But if I if I don't, you know, open up my my phone, it's it's still there, even though I can't see it. And I'm not taking advantage of it. I'm not using it. What, whatever. So, again, that's a. It, it's an oversimplification, but that's what I believe. That in some way, something that I don't understand and that I can't really explain is there. It's some power that provides certain things that I can use. I can take advantage of that help me in my life whether they're very simple, simplistic uh, necessities or whether they're luxuries. And it's, up, it's my choice whether I want to plug in or not or whether I want to you know, answer the phone or make a call or turn on the television or, or whatever. But just because I choose not to be doing that doesn't mean that the power is not there. So, so, the, so what I need to do, it's not like that God needs me to pray or that God, you know, God need, needs me only to know that that power is there. Should I choose to use it? Should I choose to need it in, in one way or another? Okay. That God's not going to provide the answers. But God is going to give me the opportunity to do things in my life differently, more conveniently, 
what however you want to describe. That's that's kind of in 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 again in simplistic terms, that's kind of the way that I believe. And having said that, um any anybody have questions or questions, arguments, debates, oh, clarifications. <laughs> God was a lousy engineer. <laughs> <laughs> created people. Now the people create something with defective parts to start off with. And it seems that God has done. Okay, Jeanette, you need to speak a little bit louder. Okay, all right. All right. So, okay. so that so, no engineer would create. No engineer. <laughs> Create something with defective parts. With defective parts. An engineer wants the life of the machine to go the distance, right? Yeah. God creates people. God creates animals that can only exist by killing other animals. Creates people with defective parts, like things in your children who are born with cerebral palsy, things like that. Um, what kind of an engineer? The things that makes God just be that really bad engineer or safe. In the same way, is God the creator who does make the flowers, the trees, the beauty of the world, the mountains, that would be God the artist. And so if you're going to think about it, God, the artist, he should have stuck to what he knows best. <laughs> I, I know quite a few engineers who, who would say, you know, I wish I would have done it better. I wish that I would have used a different kind of material. Next time. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, next, next time. Right. You know, I, 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 no, uh, uh, again, none of, none of these are, are you know, are, are perfect. Again, and we, we, we're going to, either we're going to say we don't understand, or we're going to say we don't have the language to, to better describe it. Uh, one one way or the other, or we're going to say, "Look, that's just the way that it is." And who are we to uh, is the question? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sue, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say uh, the way I interpret things. Uh, it, I don't believe it was said in, in the Torah that God made man perfect. Speak up, or that speak I, up, because I, I can't hear you. I don't think that uh, there was a statement made to the effect in Torah that uh, when God created man, it was perfection. Um, he, he created man with potential. Uh, what man does with it. Or uh, how the life is lived is yet another story, but I don't think everything is laid out in advance. I don't believe that for a minute. Okay, no, no, you're you're right. I don't think the Torah says that human beings were created perfect. Uh, were created very good. Yes. Okay. At least, at least God saw. Let, let's say to use your word, God saw the potential that we could be very good. But I think also there's one other thing that's important that man was created after everything else. Yeah, that's a very important fact, I think. Which means what? Uh, which means in the scheme of things, uh, we are not supreme. Uh, man is not supreme. Uh, and and should and in my opinion, it's all about balance of nature. The other things came way before man. Man is the steward of the other things. That's how I see it. Um, he, he was not designated as the ruler of all the other. Well, actually, in the Torah, it does say ruler. 
It does for me. Uh -huh. I don't remember mm -hmm. So he has dominion over the earth. Yeah, that's very interesting. I always saw it as a story. Well, well, that's the way that's the way that Jewish tradition has understood it and said, yes, you know, that and that, that actually comes more out of the the, the psalmists and, and some of the prophets of yes, that 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 God said this is this is the this is the world I get, you know, I put it in your hands. You know, keep it well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the story of creation, it's uh, you know, and I place you, I place you here that you can have that you have dominion over all the other animals and the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it does have does have that phrase. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Okay, John, one more. I don't know if there's anybody up here. Um, um. The translation, what ruler means in the original sense, what is a ruler? Does that take that's um, that, what is the function of a ruler? Uh, uh, so that's a yeah. whole, whole thing. How did that word come well, to be used? Yeah, more, more like dominion. Yes. Uh, you know, a, a power over. Um, uh, uh, more like uh, you know, you're more important than kind of, kind of. Thing. But again, what what I'm saying, what what I think, what, what Sue is implying is that tradition has kind of backed away from that. So we don't we don't want to feel that we're more important. No, you know, yes, it, it says that we're low, we're a little lower than the angels, kind of thing, and we're and. And some people, we're, we're the human beings are the pinnacle of creation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can take advantage of all of God's other things. Right. Mm -hmm. So this argument. What's the Hebrew word that you mean? Or, you know? Well, the phrase is the Hebrew phrase or do be God is is um uh, I mean that's the way that they translate it, it's have dominion over. Um, we could look. We could look up a more, you know, a, a more, a more important one. It's not this. <coughs> it's not the same word as like a king or a queen, like melech or mal. It's, you know, it's, it's not dominate. It's more like dominate. Okay. Yeah, more like dominate. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy it. Um, we will meet again next week and uh, uh again if at any time over the next couple of week couple of weeks if you do have if there are questions or if there's something of you know where did such and such come from uh this I this idea or uh or do we really believe that so, you know shoot me a shoot me an email or text or or bring it in and we'll we'll make sure that we add it to the agenda for uh for one of the sessions in the okay Thanks. Be well, everyone. Thank you.